Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Now today, I want to tell you about the relationship between the theory of modules and Fourier analysis. More precisely, what I want to do is I want to show you how the theory of uh, Fourier analysis can be explained better if you consider modules, and furthermore, show you how, in many ways, Module theory is just a generalization of Fourier analysis. And the way I'll do that is I'll begin by looking at the following theorem. This theorem is uh, considered when you look at the discrete Fourier transform. So to begin with, we're going to start with a positive integer n. And we're going to look at the following primitive nth root of unity, e to the 2 pi i on n, which I denote by zeta. Then one way to describe the discrete Fourier transform is to say that we have the following basis for c to the n. It's given by these n vectors. And one way to look at these vectors is very simply that they're geometric progressions, OK? They're entries, OK? This one has common ratio 1. This one has common ratio zeta. And then all the way up to the last one has common ratio zeta to the n minus 1. And it's quite easy to check that this is a basis you can form the square matrix with these vectors as its columns, and that's a van der Mond determinant, uh, or at least the determinant of that matrix is a van der Mond determinant, and you can check that that's non-zero. Okay, so how is this related to the usual Fourier series that you've seen in the continuous case? Well, in that case, what you want to do is you want to look at periodic functions instead, and the space of them, and it has a basis in an appropriate sense, and it consists of these complex exponential functions. Now, if you want to convert this into a discrete situation, what do you do? You need to sample this at discrete uh, values of z. So you can sample at this at z equals 0, 1 on n, 2 on n, all the way up to n minus 1 on n. And you'll find if you do that, for example, at k equals 0, of course, you just get e to the 0 all the time. So you'll get 1s. But if you have k equals 1, and your sample here, you'll get these values instead. And you can continue this up to k equals n minus 1, and then they repeat themselves. Now, of course, why is uh, Fourier analysis a good thing? Well, you learn in your analysis classes that these functions form an orthonormal basis. And similarly, these vectors also form an orthonormal basis for Cn. But there are lots and lots of orthonormal bases for Cn. So why is this one a good one? And that's what I want to tell you today, and that's where the module theory comes in. OK, so to do that, the basic idea is that we want to use as much symmetry as possible. So we have to involve a group, and what's the group that we involve here? In this case, the group we need has order n, and it's just a cyclic group of order n. It's g equals z mod n. And then we're going to view this cn in a different way. We're going to consider v to be the vector space of complex-valued functions on g. OK, so g has n elements in it. So you're just looking at functions on an n element set. So that's basically just c to the n. And to make that explicit, uh, we can write down an isomorphism from v to c to the n as possible. If you have a function on g, you can map it to the following n tuple, z0 down to z n minus 1. How do you do that? You just list all the values of f. So for example, you can send f to just f of 0 bar is the first value, where 0 bar is the residue of 0 modulo n. f1 bar all the way down to f n minus 1 bar. And that gives you your isomorphism between v and c to the n. So what's the advantage? of writing this c to the n like this. Well, the point here is that there's a very natural symmetry which plays on this v. In fact, there's a g symmetry. And why is that? This is just functions on g. 
And G has a symmetry because it's a group. So in particular, you can translate by elements of the group on G, and that gives you a symmetry on G, and that induces a symmetry on V as well. OK, let's see how that works. So suppose, for example, you want to translate by 1. So that means that you send J bar, the residue of J, modulo N, an element inside here, and you can add 1 bar to it. And the corresponding symmetry on the functions is as follows. What you can do is you can send a function f to a new function sigma f. And that's going to be the function whose value at j bar is f of j bar plus 1. OK? So this gives you a symmetry of this vector space v, and hence also a symmetry of this c to the n. Well, let's see what happens. Basically, you're just cycling all the values around. So in terms of this n-tuple, what happens? So remember at 0, you look at the value where it was at 1. So basically, the z1 gets shifted up to the top spot. So on this vector, z0 down to zn minus 1, this vector will get sent to z1, z2, and all the values cycle up, but the top one gets put down to the bottom. So that gives you a symmetry of this c to the n. All it does is it just cycles the entries around so that the top one goes to the bottom and the others just shift up one. OK, so what's the point of this extra symmetry? Well, it's the following. So it is a symmetry. It's a g symmetry. So this sigma has order n. If you raise it to the power of n, you get the identity. OK, you can see this quite easily from this description here. If you cycle around n times, eventually this vector will get back to where you started. And what's another way of describing this symmetry? Well, for example, if you look in terms of my video on matrix equations, you see that that means that this c to the n and this vector space v, they're both modules. Modules over what ring? The following ring here. The polynomial ring Cx modulo x to the n minus 1. And where does this equation x to the n minus 1 come from? It comes from this equation here, the fact that sigma to the n equals the identity. Another way of writing this ring here is it's actually the group algebra Cg, if you've learnt about the group algebra. And this captures the fact that the symmetry, the module structure that we have here, is due to this group. OK, so how can we use this module structure? So we see here that V and hence Cn has this extra R module structure. And what can we do with it? Well, the point I want to make here is that there are lots of ways you can decompose this C to the N as a direct sum of one-dimensional vector spaces. They correspond to bases. But using the R module structure, you can say why this is a good decomposition. It's the one which is most compatible with the symmetry that's involved here. And how is that? So note that this is not just a vector space. It's also an R module. So you can try to decompose it as an R module. And the point is that. This decomposition here is as a decomposition of R modules as well. And why is that? All you need to check is that each of these one-dimensional spaces is invariant under the action of the ring. Since it's a vector space over C, and your ring is this one here, you just need to check that it's stable under multiplication by the x here, which corresponds to your sigma. In other words, it's stable under the action of sigma, which just means that they're eigenvectors for sigma. And the point is that this is actually a sigma eigenspace decomposition for c to the n. And why is that? Let's just check quickly. Well, what does sigma do? It just cycles the entries around. But these are geometric progressions. So if you slide them all up, they just get multiplied by the common ratio. 
So that explains how module theory singles out this decomposition of C to the N as a nice one because it is the most compatible with the symmetry that's involved. The other thing that we see is that actually this theory generalizes to other groups, not just the finite cyclic group that we have here. In fact, it generalizes with some work to groups G, which are locally compact Hausdorff and Abelian. And the simplest example, of course, is just the real numbers modulo the integers, R mod Z, also known as the circle group. And if you work in this context here, what you'll get is the theory of Fourier series. You have to be a little bit more careful in this case because, well, the space of functions is no longer finite dimensional, so you have to be uh, a bit more careful how you define which space of functions that you want to use, and you also have to define what you mean by a basis. The other thing that you should realize is that what is module theory about? Well, there are lots of questions that you look at when you study modules, and one of them is precisely this idea here. You take a module and you work out how to decompose it into indecomposable modules, just like we have in this case here. And the point is that decomposing into indecomposable modules essentially means for each element inside your module, you're finding a nice description of that element as a sum of elements inside the indecomposable summons. So in that way, module theory really is just a generalization of the Fourier analysis that you should be very familiar with. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. To see more, you can look at my website.